I can do it. Okay. I'll do it. All right. Good talk. Woo! Let's do this. Mm. All right. Mm. Welcome to this episode <sighs> of Dad Bod History, where the beers are cold and the takes are old. Before we get started, make sure you guys like, subscribe, follow, and uh, hit that notification bell. So. Except tonight it's uh, Viking blood, mead, Drink and the it's, night uh, is Viking blood. it's room temperature. So Excellent. So in honor of the theme tonight, Olympics, I brought my sport oh. bottle. Filled with vodka. Oh, nice. Hydrated. Jeez, yeah. I came empty-handed. They hydrated. Yeah, filled with vodka. No, <laughs> I'd be done. Um, <laughs> how you guys doing? You have a good week? Yeah, it was a pretty good week. It was my last week. We go we go back to meetings tomorrow. So uh, I'm excited about that. Mm. New year. I like that. Um, nice. But I tried something this week because my summers are pretty, it's hard to keep a schedule with the summer because there's travel or just there's no structure, right? So I tend to get a little... Uh, sedentary and I get little uh mm -hmm. flabby around the edges and so this loosen week the cage loosen the cage yeah uh, this this week I was like well I gotta start working loosen out cage. <laughs> and we have a gym here at our uh complex and before I was just doing things um like in my office at our old house mm -hmm. I was doing beach body stuff and that stuff's great and I usually do pretty well with that I don't mind going out of the gym, but it's, it's ellipticals and bikes and, and weights, but I'm not, I'm not big into weights, but I thought, well, I want to do something here in, in our apartment and that I can do. And, and I started to look at stuff because I, I do want to do some weights, right? I need to get some, some weights moving. So I was like, well, I'm going to start doing a kettlebell workout. And I found a great page that has it broken up by you know, uh, this is a total, a full body workout. This is a cardio workout. This is your legs, your arms, your back, all that stuff, core. And it showed all the different moves, you know, at the bottom. And then it goes beginner, intermediate, advanced. And then a bottom of advanced is the, the Turkish get up, right? Where you hold oh, the bar. That's the worst. And so. Those are awful. Yeah. They, yeah. I, anyways. So I sat down I said, I'm going to do, I'm, I made a plan for myself on day one. It'll be. Um, five different exercises, five different groups, three sets of 10. And so on Tuesday, I started this and I started with Russian swings, which is kind of like you go from a mid squat, swing your arms in front of you. And I did 10 of those. And then I did uh, 10 goblet squats. And then I did um, some rows, right? For my back. I did, um, gosh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think what, couple of the other ones. Um, but the goblet squat and the Russian swing were pretty hefty. And then, Oh, there was a, there was a side lunge. So I get through one set of each exercise and both of my quads are like, they're not hurting. They're just not engaging as they should. They're just like, no, sorry. We're, we're we don't know what you were thinking, but we're done. <laughs> So <laughs> I sit down, I massage them and I'm just like, well, that's, that's it for the day. And everyone wakes up later on and I'm just like having trouble walking around. I'm just feeling weak. You know, it just feels fatigued the next day. They're both sore. Both quads are just incredibly sore. And I only did probably 30, maybe 40 actual squat like moves, but that's still a lot. Um, cause it's been a while. Uh, and then that was Wednesday and then Thursday, they were still hurting. Friday was the first day that I felt normal. Nice. Guess what my weight was that I was using? Uh, 10. 25. I didn't even have my kettlebell yet. <laughs> it was just my bare hands. I was just <laughs> going through the moves. <laughs> so, uh, the... Yeah, you've got a way to go before a little bit you start of a wake up those, call there, huh? Those Turkish get ups. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, I do have a 25 pound kettlebell now. Um, so I'm going to take it slow, but, uh, 
Yeah, that's that's you know that's See, a good piece of humble pie. That and saying here's right, but in fairness though, Eric, as you were explaining that, I was thinking that is is sneaky a lot of moves and a lot of weight. You know, if mm-hmm. if you're that ambitious to do ten reps five different times times three, I mean that adds up in a hurry. And oh, I've yeah. been doing those. Um, I, I was super ambitious at the beginning of COVID. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm never going to a gym again. And I was doing pretty good with my co- my uh, kettlebells, but it's just, it's hard to sustain because it's so hard. You know, you can start tricking yourself and say, oh yeah, you know, I'll just do this. And then I, I, I know that feeling because yeah. you start to make little concessions and, and all of that. Yeah. It's funny. I stuff. I haven't been going to the gym. I've been riding the bike a lot and there's this outdoor circuit on my bike path. And so I've been doing a lot of pull-ups and push-ups. And the past couple of times I decided to start filming myself. And I looked at the video from the most recent one and my form is just atrocious doing these pull-ups. I look like a kid throwing a tantrum, kicking my legs and like (laughs) not going all the way down. And it's just awful. And, (laughs) and same thing with my pushups. It's like, it just looks so bad. And it's like, it's, it's hard to do stuff right. Even if you're not actually using weights, like doing the form correctly. And if you are doing the form correctly, it's a lot harder regardless of whatever the weight is because you're engaging the muscle properly. Mm -hmm. So as sore as you were, that means you're probably doing something right, Eric, as opposed to trying to cheat your way through it. And and I've done a lot of squats with a lot of different work, especially some of the beach body stuff, you know, there's a lot of squats involved in that. So I felt pretty comfortable and confident in those. Um, and, and I know that when I add the weight and I'll kind of kick back in a little bit tomorrow, keep it a little lighter. Um, but yeah, that form on the squats, like, if you're doing it right, you're going to feel it, mm-hmm. you know, and that's kind of what I always tell students, yeah. whether I'm coaching them in basketball or it's in PE, like, um, if you, you'll know you're doing it right. Cause you feel the pain, mm-hmm. right. If, if you don't feel anything, you're doing it wrong. So hopefully I'll feel something tomorrow. Sure. Hey, and anybody can bench 300 pounds, but can you yeah. do a couple of air squats after sitting out a couple months? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good point. Follow us for more pro tips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dad bought fitness. Let's That's do this. the next, so, next iteration. So I've got my, my little update, my, uh, tales from the dad front. Um, Excellent. I was so, so angry this afternoon. Um, we are getting ready to start school and, uh, starts on Wednesday here in Arizona. So um, it's coming right up. And before I tell this story, I want you to to weigh in on how much you think I spent for my two big kids' school supplies this year. Uniforms included? Eric, you've you've done this a little bit more than than Jake has. Um, no, not even not even uniforms. Just so just pens, stuff pencils, that they needed. backpack stuff. Right. Stuff for their desks and backpacks. That's kind of exactly tricky. lunchbox, all those, uh, you know, the, it, so the question is it, more than they, book covers, that kind of thing. Are they recycling backpacks and lunchboxes from last year? Cause those, those will eat up 50 bucks a kid. Mm. Um, exactly. Right? right. So my kids did not attend school in, in person last year. Mm-hmm. So it's been a while. We need to replace our backpacks. My, we need to do all that. My boys um, are recycling got their backpacks, new shoes. Oh, yeah. Have to do that. Oh. New Just shoes. Say. I think you're over a hundred bucks a kid. If you're getting all that stuff. Exactly. And that's oh. just the, Shoes and backpack alone are going to yeah. get you to a hundred. We haven't now the supplies aren't necessarily expensive <sighs> until you add up all the different things. Um, yeah. But we, we also, my wife went shopping at home because we have stuff from previous years. She's like, let's see if we have enough pencils, mm-hmm. if we have enough crayons, let's see if sure. we have a pencil. Do you want to, you, you know, you still like Minecraft. Do you want to use Minecraft pencil bag? Yeah, I do. Awesome. You just saved us three bucks. Um, I mean, you shopped for three kids for school supplies. Well, our our youngest is four, and she's not attending 
preschool this year, but we got her a few things just because she wanted to be a big kid. Right. So factor well, that I'm in guessing you were, well. you were pushing 200 easily. Oh, yeah. We were well north of that. Well north of that. Really? Yeah. So I... It, it, Three of us are our teachers. I, I got to set this up a little bit. But, um, you know, when I used to set up my classroom, I'd say, you know, get a couple of pencils, get a couple of notebooks, you know, and I'd, I'd tell them a couple few guidelines. Nowadays, and I don't know if this is your experience, Eric and Jake, but it needs to be a purple colored three ring binder, three inch only. And then you've got to have a college ruled not the other one ruled. Mm -hmm. You've got to have um, mechanical pencils. You've got to have 15 of them. The dadgum Kleenexes, which I don't know why I need to pay for everybody's snot nose. You know, that I feel like that should be a school supplied thing. All of these things. And you guys know, I am legendarily cheap. I don't know anybody else that's as cheap as I am. Please tell me you My buy wife at least the Ticonderoga home. pencils. Please don't tell me you buy the cheap pencils though. No, they they want the they want the mechanical pencils as if really? that's somehow better. But yeah, the Ticonderoga is like the better, but they don't want those. They want the the cheapies. Mm. Even with the cheap pencils and all of that, um, my wife came in saying, "Okay, brace yourself. Good yeah. news, I saved us forty five bucks. Bad news, it was three hundred and twenty dollars wow. for my three kids." Yes. Okay. So, but, okay. Yes. So, and I'm on. so that, angry. That about includes it. backpack and shoes for all three. Still, uh, no, well, no, but because you, ba but remember backpack when we were and kids? shoes. No, uh, I, two and a half. When I was a kid, okay. Well, I remember getting a Jan Sport backpack. There's for no way my bucks. parents spent half of that. That's well, what okay, saying. inflation. But no, like a Jan Sport yes. backpack will be thirty, thirty-five bucks. You throw in a good lunchbox, you're at 50. You, pu you put in a good pair of shoes, that's 40. So you've got two mm -hmm. kids. That's already 180. Okay. So another- You're trying to make it right. sound like it's better than it is. No, or? no. What I'm saying is I, I'm trying to separate school <laughs> supplies from, from backpacks and shoes. Because I, I, you know, there's a school supply list. I know backpacks are on that. Um, but- so here's but still here, like Target. No, I, what they charge for a notebook is atrocious. So that's where you got to, You know, I, if you go with uh, yeah, the up and up I, brand, you're going to save two bucks on a notebook. If you go with five stars, you're paying yeah. a lot more. And you know that comes down to do right. you shop with your kid or do you bring them along to pick stuff out? And that can be kind of tricky. One of the, you know, but one of the issues is as a teacher, <clears throat> I make a list and and the list is like when I have them in class, here's what I want them to have. A one inch binder might not be enough, especially in some grades. I know my daughter had got a two inch binder. That two inch binder is her portfolio of work through the year. That's where she collects stuff. So that makes sense. I understand how that's going to be used. Um, when, when it comes down to different kinds of, you know, composition book versus a spiral bound notebook versus loose leaf paper, you know, it's all Teachers make supply lists. So like, here's what I know they need. And when they come with the wrong thing, it's a problem because we can't be efficient in the classroom. But on the other right. end, I also and, have to And that was my lists. wife's point is, is my, my, my wife's point was, you know, you don't want them first day to be the only kid that doesn't want, doesn't have their stuff. And then, you know, they're all nervous and it's the first day and Finally, I just relented and said, fine, whatever. But I mean, this is a real live racket that, you know, the 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 baby industry, the wedding industry, and now the first day of school industry is just out of control. It was in darn this country. baby mills. And um, something's got to be done. Uh, I mean, listen, I, I, I remember at, at the school that the three of us taught at, one of the recommendations I made one time that got shot down by none other than a parent was that um, we could we could legitimately make a classroom supply list and buy those things in bulk as a school and just say, here's the amount this costs and pass it on to parents. And the parents push back and say, no, they like shopping and getting those unique things for their kids. And I get that. I, I actually appreciate that part of it too, but uh, I don't know. I mean, do you want to cut costs or do you want your kids would, to be able to express I, themselves? 
Yeah, and I still and that, I, we, that leads it lends itself to. We still have to go get shoes. And I just I'm sorry, you reminded I me of that. There. And you reminded me of the fact that we still have to go get shoes. Now I'm down about it. I'm sad. Because it's just, I know yeah, how much that's going to cost. But it's you know, red okay. this time. We well, also had to buy your uniforms. in two months. So you get to buy yeah. them again and yeah. again. Yeah. We also <laughs> bought uniforms. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Cameron, you got uniforms too? That's a pretty penny. We, I mean, yeah, we get we a do. lot of, we get a lot of hand-me-downs from other families, mm-hmm. like kids we've taught. They're like, here, my kids no longer needs them. Here they are. So we have quite a bit of stuff. Um, yeah. We'll have stuff for our youngest boy when he comes in in these uniforms. Cause we've kept all that, but still I, I spent a chunk on uniforms because we also know how our kids are. Our yeah. son doesn't want, <clears throat> he wants a shorts that he can just pull up and doesn't have to buckle a belt and stuff. Well, we can only get the ones that really fit directly from the uniform manufacturer. We get shirts from somewhere else because he likes a different feel of shirt. And then, you know, they want a sweatshirt and they want it. It's like, oh, my well, gosh. it sounds like you're just letting your kid have too yeah. many, too many decisions in this situation. So you could get them the burlap. And then they sell you the form. coffee cup. You look good. <laughs> you look good. You school good. That's what Jake's going to put his kids in. <laughs> yep. No, I feel I, it. Yeah, I feel it, it gets out of control pretty quick. Speaking of ridiculous amounts of money, oh, Jake probably has something, right? Yeah, hey, we spent 20 minutes talking about that. We can move on. <laughs> I totally sympathize. <laughs> like we we did our budget for this month, and there's a large, there's a an envelope full of cash dedicated to back to school stuff waiting to go so waiting to just burn yeah we're in the exact same boat i'm like oh we have money i bet you you under budgeted too no after what you told me i think we're we're feeling pretty we're right about where we thought we would be so we're unfortunately in that three bill range so okay yeah anyway what were you gonna say eric speaking of a lot of money (laughs) spending speaking of spending a ton of money that results in nothing. The Olympics. Woo. That's a topic. <laughs> we're halfway that was a great through. Segue. I know. Well, I was, I was you were gonna say you you know, you're talking about school <clears throat> uniforms, like, well, we should do it like the Greeks, no uniforms, no nothing. Ugh. Gosh. Yeah. All right. Now it's um, <laughs> easy for you guys to say you don't teach anymore. So this is we are now in the midst of the 2020 Olympics in 2021 in Tokyo. Uh, If you guys are curious, the medal count right now is China has the most gold medals, but the United States has the most overall medals. So we got that going (laughs) for us. Um, Yeah, something that we had mentioned a a couple months ago when we were discussing this, the Olympics coming up. And and I, I think for me personally, I wanted to get into a little bit of the history of it, obviously with the original Olympics in ancient Greece. And then a little bit of the early modern Olympics and then talk about today's current Olympics and, and I guess not where the sport is, but where the sports are or the events, however you want to, to put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so first let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, the ancient Olympic games was uh, developed in 776 BC in the town of Olympia in ancient Greece. It was actually a part of, here's something that I found that was interesting. It was, there was actually four sets of games, one each year, and they were called the Panhellenic Games. So there was one in the Olymp- in Olympia, and then Pythian Games, which is by Delphi, the Nemean Games, and then the Isthmian Games, which I think mm-hmm. would be Corinth. And then each year it would rotate um, yeah, to one of I, those cities. And Olympia was the most prestigious, but... I still think that's interesting because we call it the Olympic Games, mm-hmm. but it's really in the spirit of these Pan-Hellenic Games. Correct. Uh, and and I, I think it's interesting that it did rotate. Yeah. Much like you'd say the World Cup rotates. Exactly. Uh, it's lo- you know, continentally, its location. But the fact that they had it every year was also fascinating. Well, and what's interesting, I, as I found that out, is – it reminded me almost of like um, in tennis or in golf, you have the majors, right? Because mm-hmm. Greeks had games all over, but these are the big ones. This is where you wanted to to earn your paycheck, so to speak. And uh, so if you won at the Olympics, that would be like winning the Masters. 
um, in you know, the Nemean games and Pythian and Isthmian games would be like the opens and, and all that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, but the Olympic games specifically were held every four years in the town of Olympia, which is not too far from Sparta. Um, if you're looking for a geographic reference point, I think it's a little bit west and north of ancient Sparta. Uh, and it was held every four years until 393 AD when Emperor Theodosius outlawed it. So that's almost a thousand years of Olympic Games in that's pretty good. the Greek world. Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Um, the I, events. I mean, oh, go ahead. That's that's a long time for that to run. Th- that's a long time for that to run, going from 776 BC to 393 mm-hmm. AD. I mean, 400 years of, of consistently doing that. No, a thousand. And a thousand years because you know. it's 776 bc plus another 400 oh yeah years. you're right yeah. you're right it was yep yeah yeah it's unbelievable and yeah. i mean and you think about what deal. was what was going on in greece uh the little thing called the persian wars the peloponnesian wars the peloponnesian wars when greece <laughs> fought itself uh the macedonian con- invasion yeah and then the Romans conquering Greece and like all these things happening to ancient Greece. And yet like we still got to have the games. In fact, the Persian wars in 480 BC, part of the reason that the Greeks, that the Spartans fought at Thermopylae by themselves is because all the Greeks were like, yeah, we need to fight the Persians, but we got the games going on. So can we just push that a couple months? Like that was like a legit thing. Like, <laughs> I'm serious. Like I was well, looking it up in my research. Like most American men. Uh, yeah, but the game is on. Can it wait? No, I agree. You know, it was very American <laughs> when you look at it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take out the trash. I'll take it out. Just Yeah, but there's Persians Super coming Bowl. down the street <laughs> <Yeah>. right now. <laughs> there's five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, modern uh, modern humans have had, you know, the the wherewithal to cancel games during major world conflicts. So priorities. Yeah. So I I thought that was one interesting thing. Uh, Some of the general facts of the Greek games, all athletes competed naked. Um, Women were not allowed to compete or attend. There were a couple of exceptions, most notably Kaniska of Sparta. She was a princess. She owned um, and trained chariot teams, and then she would enter them, and then men charioteers would compete with her team of horses. Did you so she, have to charioteer naked as well? Yeah, everything. That just seems odd. The only sport that I found where you actually wore clothes was one of the f- foot races, and you had to wear a full suit of armor for it. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else was naked. Um, so, Let's see, uh, one of one of the other facets of these original games is that every event had a practical application. Correct, sure. largely. I, yeah. I mean, they didn't do curling because there's no practical application for curling whatsoever. Mm-hmm. None. But throwing a javelin or driving a chariot or running fast much yeah. more useful than curling. It was all relative to basically their fitness and war. Mm-hmm. So most of the competitors were soldiers, but any free Greek man could compete, be it he at the lower right end of the spectrum or a king. I mean, but yeah, most of them were, were soldiers. Um, some other interesting things. Uh, there's three combat sports, um, wrestling, pancration, and then boxing. And as far as I can tell, Pancration is basically MMA. It's like a mix of boxing and wrestling. That's awesome. Yeah. Corporal punishment. So if you had a false start in one of the races, they had used corporal punishment instead of like just disqualifying you. They would beat you for, no for a way. false start. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jack would approve. Oh, yeah. No, he would love it. Um, two rules in the Pancration is no biting and no gouging. That's it. That's the same as MMA, right? Not too far off. Boxers <laughs> boxers were urged to avoid attacking the on-display male genitalia. So the one big rule is don't punch a guy in the nuts. <laughs> um, there were no points. Well, it sounds like it's a uh, a guideline only. 
Yeah, it sounds are, like, like it's a you know you might not yeah. want to do this because this is frowned upon. Yeah, first time's a warning. Second time, <laughs> maybe it polices um, right. itself. It's again, it's like <laughs> baseball. Yeah, if you're gonna do that, it's gonna happen. Back to you. Take care of itself. <laughs> Uh, no points, no ready. time limits, no weight classifications in boxing. So you can have some scrappy 120 pound guy going against some six foot nine monster in a boxing match. And that's just the way it was. They didn't, they didn't, I guess there's no weight classes in war. So why have it in boxing? Um, mm. Athletes in combat sports were had to indicate their surrender by raising their index fingers. Um Oftentimes they didn't do that and then they would die. So uh, sometimes they didn't get, they didn't surrender quick enough. And then boxers. So, you know, in boxing, you know, this Cameron, you boxed um, boxers, you know, when they, uh, they kind of grab each other and don't actually separate and fight. And so if you did mm. that in the boxing match and you wouldn't separate, it would be called, they could opt for a climax. And this is a system where one fighter is granted a free hit and then vice versa. And the toss of the coin decides who goes first. So if you guys don't actually box, we're going to separate, we're going to flip a coin. And then that guy gets to take a free punch at you. Like that's an effective. You know what? That sounds like one of Eric's rules. That sounds like one of Eric's off the wall. <laughs> like, it does. I tried this. Little so did Eric know of, the Greeks were doing this. A free throw in basketball for a foul. You just get to punch a guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah no jump ball punch ball yeah punch hey. each other until someone falls yeah. down exactly the body it. types would be a little bit different in the nba if that were the rules yeah so um i'm gonna go through the sports real quick long jump and the record long jump according to the these ancient greek records is 52 feet if you're not aware uh, I think the modern human has yet to crack 30 foot long jump. Now they think this 50 foot two long jump may, well, one of the things is, is the, the jumpers would run with weights in their hands. And when they would jump, they use the weights to fling themselves farther forward. And then also they think that they might have, it wasn't a true long jump. It was more like a, a triple jump, which would fit uh, that range a lot more accurately. Uh, but Kyanis of Sparta was well, and the also, long jump record oh, holder. Back then, was, wasn't foot just, you know, based on the king's length of their foot and it changed every year? I mean, um, I, that's a serious question. I, well, I think they used a cubit, which would have been from here to here, which is about 18 inches. Um, so the, your forearm is a cubit roughly. So I think the Greeks used that. I know the Egyptians did. I think the Romans did too. So I would, I would assume the Greeks and did as well. So they, yeah, well, they probably didn't actually have it measured as feet, but whatever the equivalent was, was yeah. supposedly 52 feet, but you're mm. right. Yeah. It was an imprecise measurement. The French had not come along to exact measure everything for us. Yeah. It's standardized. Yeah, they didn't go metric yet. Mm. Um, the javelin obviously used the throw, the javelin like a sling, as you said, Eric, was very practical in war and in hunting. It was also part of the pentathlon, which was the long jump discus javelin stadion, which is like a 200 meter dash in wrestling. Uh, the longest discus throw was Phalios of Croton at 95 feet. And then there's chariots, which is like the, that was the money event. That's where, that's where everybody came for is the chariot races. As I mentioned, Kaniska of Sparta, her teams that she trained won two wreaths um, during chariots, but she couldn't actually compete. So she had to have men do the actual races because she wasn't allowed to compete. Um, Pancration, which is the MMA fighting. <laughs> okay, there's this one guy, Arakion of Figalea, won while being choked to death. He shattered the ankle of his opponent who then surrendered because his opponent surrendered before he died. He was posthumously awarded wow. the wreath. And then yeah. there's, and then there's Theogenes of Thasos, who is the most decorated 
in the event. He won 1,400 wreaths in his career, although only two of those are at the Olympics. So he would just go on like a tour and just fight. And he won 1,400 times. So that's kind of like uh, Richard Gere's character in uh, First Night. Yeah. He just went around and fought for money. Like a hedge knight. Yeah, just yeah. competing for money. Yeah. Uh, boxing. Okay, so these boxing stories. So there's one who's Diagoras of Rhodes. He never dodged a punch. So he would just stand there and take your best punch. Dang. And then he'd pummel you. Like, he would never dodge. Conversely, and so he won two wreaths at the Olympics. Conversely, there's Melancomus of Caria, who won a wreath by not throwing a single punch. He just dodged the guy until the guy fell over exhausted. So if they ever fought to each other, nobody would ever win because one guy wouldn't punch and the other guy wouldn't dodge. So luckily, I think they were in two very different time periods. But um, wrestling, Mylon of Croton won six wreaths at the Olympics. He was a disciple of Pythagoras, the mathematician. Um, he was supposedly so strong that he held up the roof of Pythagoras' house during an earthquake. Um the two rules in wrestling are similar. No biting, no attacking genitals. First to three throws wins or if somebody surrenders. So, in, and so I think Greek wrestling, and I've seen this like in other countries where like you're, do they have like these cloth straps and you're basically strapped to the other guy with your hands wrapped it, in their and cloth. And it's, it's a lot of tugging and pulling yeah, rather than. you're like throwing them. You're not like, not like what we do for modern wrestling today where you're like shooting and stuff like that. It, it seemed a lot more. If you can throw them, that's that's it. Not like pinning or submissions. And then running, which should probably be the most famous sports. Um, Leonidas of Rhodes was the most decorated runner. He won 12 wreaths in 12 years. He never lost a race. And he won his last three races at 36. Um, he won the stadium four times, which is 200 meters. Polites of Karamos won the stadium which is 200 meters, the Diaulos, which is almost 400 meters, and the Dolichios, which is 3,500 meters, all in one morning. He won all three of those races in one morning. And mind you, the Diaulos is the one where you have to run in a full suit of armor. Could you imagine that? <laughs> like, and it, it, When he was 36 at the time, I mean, that's what was a life expectancy in those days. I mean, not he, great. he was an <laughs> old, in, old at, man at, at that 39. point, too. I'm in my prime. Yeah. You couldn't so. do, no, you did no weight <laughs> squats and you were crying the next day. No, it's not. I shed no tears. I, I whined right. a my lot, bad. Though. So <laughs> you're right. Like these guys, I mean, these are, and I'm not knocking Olympic runners today because they're incredible athletes, but I doubt the best of them could run those three races all in one morning and win each one of them. Usain Bolt, I don't care who it is. I don't, I can't imagine. And 3,500 meters, that's like two miles. So you're running a 200 meter dash, winning that. You're running a 400 meter dash in armor, winning that. And then you're running a two mile race afterwards and winning that in the same morning. That's incredible. I bet he didn't have any Gatorade to wash it down with either. No, he didn't. His electrolytes are low. Right. <laughs> so missed miss sponsorship opportunity there. And he had the flu. Just saying. He had a flu game. <laughs> that yeah. was his flu game. <laughs> Probably hyperextended his knee in the Eastern Conference Finals, too. Just, and just, just saying. Push through it. I, I yeah. like it. Good effort. Um, so that's my history on the, the original Olympics. I'd like to do some early modern Olympics, but I don't know what else you guys want to hit on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating that somehow this thing comes down and in the late 1800s, people are like, this sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put clothes on everybody and we're going to do this. The nudity is over, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and like you said, Eric, like. Because if we know the modern French to be anything, it's modest. Yeah, so modest. <laughs> but like you, like you said, like the modern Olympics have been postponed, boycotted for very, I mean, this past one was postponed for pandemic. World events would interfere with the Olympics. As far as I could tell, the Greeks did not let much ever interfere with their Olympics. And like during the Peloponnesian War, when they were literally fighting each other, the Olympics were still going on. Like they didn't yeah. stop the games for a silly little thing like war. Um 
it was just very interesting. But yeah, the 1800s, the, the French said, let's bring it back. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting, Jake, when, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that um, I'd be interested to know some of these athletes, what means more to them, their Olympic gold medal or their um, master's victory in golf or their NBA title or um, whatever, because it's, it's such a big deal, right? You only get a couple mm-hmm. cracks at it. Um, wh- where does that rank? Because it's, it's so special and all the pomp and circumstance. I'd, I'd say it depends on the sport. I mean, I think for basketball players, the NBA championship is the pinnacle. This is a special thing, but it's not, it's not winning a championship. It's not the same thing. Um, and while it might be special and you only get to do it a few times, it still doesn't hold the weight of that. Uh, on the other hand, or kind of can to, to contrast that the world cup is the highest achievement in soccer. Yeah. And there's guys who win, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, Oh, what is the, uh, you know, like the euros, um, mm. not, not the Euros, UEFA Champions League, which is the highest club level competition in Europe, where they win their their uh, domestic league. Um, that is great. And that actually might be a higher level of soccer, like the Champions League in Europe. The quality of soccer played among the last eight teams is probably better than in the World Cup. Mm. But the World Cup is still the greatest achievement in soccer. And so for some Olympic events, that is, that is the pinnacle, um, not for basketball, not for baseball. But like you, but you said, I mean, uh, that 92 dream team, mm-hmm. you had a bunch of guys that never won a title, an NBA title, but they won Olympic gold. I mean, Charles mm-hmm. Barkley, Carl Malone, I think John Stockton, like that's yeah. not nothing. And, and um, Carmelo Anthony, I mean, up, you know, he won uh, at least two gold medals. So I, I, yeah. I agree, Eric. I mean, I think the NBA, NBA championship is harder to win for an American than winning Olympic gold usually because we just dominate mm-hmm. it. But I, I would still say it's a big deal. To oh, it, it is a big deal. Yeah. But I wonder, I wonder if Carmelo Anthony would trade two gold medals for an NBA championship. He would, you know. Maybe, maybe not, but I mean, you can, you can make the argument that he's the best Olympic basketball player ever. Mm -hmm. And that counts for something. I think he won three gold medals over 12 years. And I think we're using basketball because that's an American sport. Whereas like soccer, like it's a world sport. And so I think any way you can excel in a world sport, I think you would prize that. I mean, I, I, not that I'll ever be in that situation, well, but I mean, if I won a world cup, that would be awesome. And I guess you're right. That is the pinnacle, but if I also won Olympic gold in soccer, that would also be just as odd. Like I wouldn't. That's come, something. The you know. The issue with Olympic gold or Olympic soccer is it's um, I think you can only have two or three players who are over the age of 23 on your squad for that. Yeah. So it has to be a young squad. They're aiming towards the amateurism. Hmm. Um, but I'd say for the majority of Olympic sports, this, this is the pinnacle. Um, because it's, it's the biggest stage you're going to be on. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that we say that because when it first, when it restarted in 1896, it was not the pinnacle of sports. Um, 200 participants, 280 participants from 13 countries, almost all of them were European countries. And the sports were cycling, fencing, gymnastics, shooting, swimming, tennis, weightlifting, wrestling, and then athletics, which would be your track and field sports. Mm -hmm. Um, Medals, winners originally received silver medals, um, but then they retroactively made them gold medals after 1904. Um, So originally it was silver and then copper for second place and then third place didn't get anything for the first Olympics. (laughs) Um, in the 1900 Olympics in France, they didn't get medals at all. They were given like trophies or cups. Um, uh, USA won the most gold in the original first Olympics. So look at us. Um, Carl Schumann of Germany won the most events for in wrestling and gymnastics. 
which well there you go that's fascinating to me yeah uh, they don't really go together i yeah. don't know if you've seen kind of the video of gymnastics from the 1960s where they do the uh the vault right you run you hit the uh the the trampoline type thing you hit the vault and you do a trick and and originally like the gold medal medal winner ran jumped pushed himself off the vault and landed and he puts his hands up and you contrast that with what these girls are doing now where they hit the trampoline they hit the vault and they do like a two and a half twist and a spin and land it yeah Mm -hmm. it how much it is has advanced is wild yeah exactly yeah, so I mean, Carl Schumann was probably just kind of like a, a pretty fit dude who could could stretch well, and yeah. that's how he won wrestling and gymnastics. Um, some of these early Olympic sports, and so these weren't just the first ones. A, a lot of them were in 1900. Tug of war Bring was in back. the second ever Olympics. Bring it there back. There's a little scandal with this one. There was only one match between France and then a mixed Denmark and Swedish team. So a Scandinavian team in France. Mm. The USA was supposed to be in that match, but they couldn't because it like interfered with rowing or something. Were they the same team? What do you mean? Were they the same people? Well, did they yeah. have to go row to... And then they yeah, like before. there's like a scheduling conflict. So the America couldn't do that. Be part of it. So France and and Den and the Scandinavian team tugged, and France won. <laughs> I don't know how else you want to put that. They tugged. They tugged it out. Is there something wrong about that, Eric? Nothing. Just. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so they lost, or so France, or no, the Scandinavians took gold. Sorry, the French did not. So then the Americans later on tugged against the Scandinavians and beat them yeah. and said, no, we're the winners. And the IOC or whatever version of it was oh. back then said, no, it's not an official match. You guys are just being jerks. So unofficially America won, but officially they did not. That's uh, awesome. I know. <laughs> But you're right. Bring it. I would love to watch some high level Olympic tug of war in the Olympic. Like, I think that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Um, some other early sports, croquet in 1900, only one year. Uh, France won. They swept it. <laughs> so they, they won all the medals because they were the only country that participated. Um, Basque Pelota, which is basically racquetball, as far as I can understand. That was in 1900. I I think did a lot of Midwesterners participate in the Olympics back then? Because these are just all over the Midwest. Well, you know, the the 1904 Olympics was in St. Louis. So that's not too far off. There you go. Um, Solo synchronized swimming. Let me say that again. (laughs) Solo synchronized swimming. Sounds about right. 1984, 88, and 92. It happened three times, folks. She's out of sync. Three times. Somebody... Well, yeah. And U.S. won gold twice. So good for us. We won solo. <laughs> synchro- so that's just some kid in the pool spinning around humming to himself. I don't know. That's not that's not a sport, but it so was. My kid I mean, we dominated. won gold, so it was a sport. Yeah. Here's another one. 1904. Plunge for distance. So you dive into a pool and see how far you can swim underwater before coming up. <laughs> America swept it, folks. We took it all. That is a great one. Live pigeon shooting, 1900. <laughs> Again, was a these era. need to come back. Guess what country won? Not America. I'm just going to tell you that. It wasn't America. England. It was a European nation. England? That's a good guess, yeah. No, Belgium. Hmm. Some Belgian guy shot 21 pigeons and took it. <laughs> 300 pigeons were killed for this event. So I have a lot of questions. <laughs> how do, how yeah. do you set up competitive pigeon shooting? Because just, yeah, how do you know, know some of those pigeons I, aren't on the take? Exactly. What if you, how put do you know in that box, pigeon is part of the contest? And he's not just some guy. Up. Maybe, <laughs> maybe one doesn't go out of the box. Maybe okay. one wants to stay in the box and that guy's a, I disadvantage. think those are fair questions. I think those are all good questions. Are they colored? Like, did somebody they, yeah. paint them? Did they paint them like blue and sport. red? If if you miss them, the in round one, do they? Does somebody catch them? Is it like the home run derby? So Is that, that basically more... what you're saying? Like you round it and like 
Sorry, you got 10 pitches in round one. You got seven pigeons. Exactly. Out of 10, round two. Oh, you move on to round two. Okay. So you got eight out of 10 this time. Maybe. Exactly. That's a good question. That's a lot of pigeons you're going through. That's a lot you, of pigeons. You got to re-catch them or, or yeah. and, and then they're going to be extra gun shy the second time around. <laughs> I don't know. I would want to go now first. Now they're zigging and zagging. Like exactly. They, There's a lot of strategy in that yeah. game. Is there a coin flip involved? I don't know. As Eric said, bring it back. I'm, I agree. Let's oh, see yeah. this. Eric needs to be the chairman of the rules committee on the live on pigeon shooting. Here's another one I think Eric would like. Pistol dueling. <laughs> <laughs> but this was in 1906, which was an intercalary year. I don't, I, for whatever year they, they did it in after 1904 and then 1912 and they didn't actually shoot each other they would just walk turn 10 paces turn and shoot a mannequin and i guess well, if you i mean i guess that makes sense if you got the best shot that's how you won got a little Here's soft I mean, from the ancient olympics you yeah. couldn't you wouldn't be able to give out a a bronze medal no right because no, that be guy is not gold or silver it. that's it yeah well and silver who are you giving it to well, so, posthumously, I mean, the Greeks <laughs> didn't care about that. So, yeah, here you go. Lay it on him. Um, 200 meter, meter obstacle course swim. Ooh, that's, that's a like cool a, one. That's like a Tough mutter type thing. Yeah. That was in... Uh, Sounds like the water balloon war. Oh, Let's I didn't it. write down the year it was. <laughs> I didn't write down what year it was. I apologize. Um, but it was, I think it was like 1900 or 1904. Climb a pole, crawl over a row of boats... Swim under another row of boats. Australia won that one, which sounds like something Australia would win. Very Australian sport. And then this is the next, my last one, ridiculous Olympic sport. Poodle clipping, which is just like it sounds. You're clipping a poodle. You're cutting a poodle's hair. For time, for style. Are there judges for time? Subjective? So you need to clip the fur off as many poodles as you could in two <laughs> hours. <laughs> and so anyways, the, the Greeks had practical hold on. sports. No, 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 no. I'm not done. Avril Lafoule, who was a farmer's wife in France. What was his name? What was her name? Avril or Avril. Lafoule. Lafoule. Clipped 17 poodles. She won it. So I think that's got to be one of the first female gold medalists in the Olympics. That's got to be a record. I mean, 17 poodles in two hours. I, and I'm I guessing, don't think I'd do more than 13. Where do you get these poodles from? Again, it's the pigeon uh, issue. It's got to be a horrifying <laughs> event. Like, there's got to, it's just got to be <laughs> awful. And I'm guessing because she's a farmer's wife. So she's a farmer herself. She was, you know, probably shearing sheep. And she's like, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try this poodle event. Like, and, Boom, 17. Mm. Like, yeah. That's a record that will never be broken right there. Yeah, no, PETA is not going to let poodle clipping or pigeon shooting back into the Olympics. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> just grooming. I mean, that's okay. Yeah, I don't know. If Peter you're grooming for speed, that. you're going to be. Yeah, there's going to be some stray yeah. cuts. There's going to be some going. lost tails, some docked ears. It's not going to be. It's not going to be good. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see a problem. I, I know you it's... don't. Um, and then the last early Olympic thing I want to go over is the 1904 marathon in St. Mm. Louis. Um, the competitors, I mean, it was the second ever Olympic or I guess third ever Olympics. Um, it consisted of American Sam Malore and Thomas Hicks, who were actual marathoners that ran the Boston marathon, which at the time was like the marathon. Um, American Fred Lors, who trained at night because he was a bricklayer during the day. Uh, there were 10 people from Greece that had never run in a marathon that were competing. There was two men from a tribe in South Africa that were just visiting and ended up in the race barefoot. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Felix Carbajal from Cuba. He got enough money to make it to America and he lost all his money in New Orleans on a dice game. So he had to hitchhike to St. Louis to compete. Uh, when he got there, he was wearing a beret, a long sleeve shirt, dark pants, and street shoes. He cut his pants off at the knee to run. Uh, the day of the race, it was 90 degrees and humid. There was only two water stations. Uh, William Garcia just collapsed on the road from so much dust, it ripped open his stomach lining. So it was so dusty, uh. he was coughing, and he almost died. Uh, one of the guys from South Africa was chased off the course for a mile by wild dogs. 
Which I think you bring that back into a marathon, you're going to get some good times. That's just <laughs> bringing the wild dogs. Yeah. Uh, the guy from Cuba, Felix Carval, frequently stopped to chat with spectators and stole peaches. Um, he stopped at an apple orchard and ate some apples. Uh, unfortunately, they were rotten. So then he started getting cramps. So he took a nap <laughs> in the middle of the race. <laughs> Um, Melor, who was one of the, the actual marathoners, he also got cramps. Um, Lors, the guy that was the bricklayer, he got cramps, but he hitchhiked for, <laughs> he hitched a ride for the last 11 miles of the race. So he actually, and finished, that was your winner. <laughs> he finished first and they all gave him a wreath and a medal. And like Teddy Roosevelt was like, his daughter was there and she was like, Oh, an American one. And then they found out he cheated. So he was disqualified. And he's like, ah, I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> Hicks was attended to by a two man crew. So he had two people running with him for the race. Um, and they refused to give him water, but they would sponge his mouth with distilled water. And they'd also feed him egg whites and strychnine to keep him going. Um, which is the first recorded use of drugs in the Olympics. And uh, I mean, scandal. I'm no medical expert, but isn't that lethal to take strychnine? Yeah, it can kill you. But apparently in small doses, it can like boost your energy and metabolism. And so huh. give you more energy to finish. Huh. Um, he was feeling he was feeling worse, though, um, after a few miles of strychnine and egg whites. And so they gave him <laughs> more with brandy to wash it down. That did the trick. Eventually, he started hallucinating. His skin is pale and ashen. Here's one of the quotes from the race official. Hicks was running mechanically like a well-oiled piece of machinery. His eyes were dull, lusterless. The ashen color of his face and skin had deepened. His arms appeared as weights well tied down. He could scarcely lift his legs while his knees were almost stiff. His trainers physically had to carry him over the finish line, and he was the winner. That's the guy that won the marathon in 1904 in St. Louis. That's awesome. Yeah. So how, how did the, how did the Cuban guy fare with the naps and eating the peaches and I just took a nap. His, I mean, I, that was the end of the story as far as I, said, I saw. Uh, yeah. He didn't. I need a leader leader board here. I need yeah. some, uh, some detail. Yeah, do we have the official times from that? Yeah. Marathon? Maybe. I don't know. Seven hours. And... Yeah. Um, some other early Olympians, Jim Thorpe, probably my favorite. Uh, in 1912, he won the pentathlon and decathlon. Um, King Gustav of Sweden gave him an award and said he was the greatest athlete in the world, to which Jim Thorpe replied, thanks, King. Um, as you know, Jim Thorpe had his medals stripped from him um, by yeah, the so IOC. I, I was Go reading ahead. about this. It was stripped by the IOC and also... Um, the AAU, which was the uh, American Athletics um, Amateur Union. Athletic Union. Yeah, Amateur Athletic Union, which is uh, my arch nemesis, you know, just because for being an amateur association, they run a ton of basketball tournaments that make a ton of money for not the athletes. Mm -hmm. But they basically said, well, you got paid to play baseball. So you're a professional athlete. So we're going to take your medals away from you. But there's a couple of problems with this. One is um, most college baseball players played professionally during the summers. It's what they did because they're like, well, I can make money. Um, the other part of this was that the IOC and AAU did not actually do this in time. They're supposed to lodge this complaint within 30 days. They didn't. And so they didn't even follow their own rules. However, as a result of this happening, uh, once people started hearing that Jim Thorpe was a professional athlete, he got professional offers mm -hmm. for real pay. So, you know, that was, and did you see what the pay he got when he yeah, was a baseball like, two what? bucks a week or yeah, two 50, to... $52 a game in yeah. today's money. Um, his act, his pay per week would have been almost a thousand dollars a week today. Yeah. Which I but, mean, what he said was, he goes, oh, man. He, he goes, all the other players do it. He goes, I just didn't have an alias. So yeah. all the, all the other players would play under a uh, fake name and that's mm -hmm. how they got away with it. And he did. And he just, you know, I guess shame on him. He, he played under the name Jim Thorpe and that's how they got him. Um, but yeah, he had a long 
actual baseball career for six years. He played pro football. Um, he was voted all NFL in 1923. I mean, he also had a, uh, him and some other native Americans had a basketball team and they would go around and play games professionally. Like he might be one of the greatest all around athletes yeah. ever to he, exist. We played for professional baseball. He, you said he played for the NFL. Yeah. I played a uh, pro football from 1916 to 1928. Um, and after the NFL in 1921, he played in the NFL for those last seven years. Um, I mean, he was just an incredible, incredible athlete. He did things that were almost mythical. He was so good. Mm. Um, Winning the pentathlon and decathlon, which in themselves are not single events. It's a five event thing and a 10 event thing. And he dominated that and he'd never really done those before. I mean, he's just, it's a, it's a shame. I mean, it was posthumously, they gave his medals back to, I think his, his children, but, I mean, he was something else. Yeah. That's why uh, uh, I, I kind of jumped into the modern Olympics. Um, yeah. So the, in the 1900 Olympics were the first Olympics that allowed women to compete. Now, there's a couple things about this. Helene uh, de Portales uh, was the first woman to become an Olympic women uh, champion in sailing. And I think that was actually a mixed event. Like her partner was a man. It wasn't an all female event. But those Olympics started in May and ended in October. Really? Yeah. Mm. And so the events happened every few weeks. So if you were there for running, you showed up in June or July. If you were there for archery, it was in August. So it was just this spread out event, um, which still boggles the mind. It reminds me, and, and to think each of these Olympics, especially early on, if you're going to them from another country, or from another continent, you're going to have to get on a boat, which is several weeks, uh, several weeks worth of journey. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened in like the 1930s and the 1950s for the World Cup. If Europe was hosting it, South American teams didn't come to it. If South America was hosting it, European teams didn't come to it because it was, you had all that travel that they didn't want to deal with. Uh, so I imagine this is kind of similar with the Olympics in these early mm -hmm. years. No, I would agree with that. That's interesting. I didn't realize that that it took so long. It almost sounds like the Olympics, what we consider the trials, the Olympic trials would almost be part of it. Like it was that it just kind of encompassed everything, but yeah. Yeah. And it makes me think about the venues too. I mean, did the host country put a bunch of money into, you know, no. putting together a track stadium or, or whatever, or does it just mm. choose it by, a city that has those facilities given. I, I, I don't know. I know in the 1904, the St. Louis Olympics is, is the reason they did it was because they were also hosting the world fair that year. And so mm -hmm. actually the Olympics kind of took a back seat to the world's fair. Um, but that's why they picked it as the host city. But yeah, you're right. I mean, what well, was the first one was in France, which probably already had a lot of those facilities pre-done. Yeah. Or no, the first one was in Greece. Second one was in France. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, just the the sheer logistics of everything is just it's it's a big deal now. But yeah, like you said, spreading it out and getting athletes there on time is is a biggie due to weather and travel and there's it's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. Um. So sticking in the modern Olympics vein, I. I know Eric, you mentioned this kind of discussing what were some of the top moments from the modern Olympics history. I mean, and there's been a lot of them that have, have shaped our culture, our politics, our world events. Um, and some of them are just, just great moments on, on a, on a sports level. So yeah, 1900 so, first female athlete. We already talked about Jim Thorpe. Um, what else? It, you get to 1936, which is kind of, I'd say that's, like a watershed moment for Olympics being a big event mm -hmm. because uh, Nazi Germany hosted it. Hitler wanted to put on display the, the Aryan people being a dominant race. Uh, but it was also the first time that uh, radio waves were actually going to make it outside the atmosphere of earth. Um, and it, it was like this big international event because uh, the, the Germans put a ton into this. 
And as it would happen, the Americans sent 18 African American African Americans as member of the U.S. Olympic team, and they earned 14 medals while in Berlin, which and eight of those were gold. Um, again, Jesse Owens was part of that, and kind of not necessarily spit in the face of the Nazis, but it it definitely set them back. Here's something um, that you know, obviously, the Germans were thinking. Um, there's no way that these African people can win against white people. Right. Um, and so here's something that uh, I'm trying to find uh, Joseph Goebbels Nazi propagandist wrote in his diary he said white humanity should be ashamed of itself when he saw these African-Americans perform as well as they did. Uh, and then, and it wasn't necessarily because they lost it's because they shouldn't, whites should not have allowed these Africans to compete. That's what he was commenting. Um, somebody, the leader of the Hitler youth actually told Hitler, you should pose for a photo with Jesse Owens. That would be good for publicity. And Hitler said, the Americans ought to be ashamed of themselves for letting their medals be won by Negroes. I myself would never shake hands with one of them. And this kind of, continued obviously jesse owens owned those olympics and uh the germans especially the nazis kind of had to hang their heads and, and put their tails between their legs because they didn't get to demonstrate supremacy of any sort uh, and these african-americans performed wonderfully and represented the united states um in these 1936 games, which are going to be the last games to be played before 1948. They're going to take mm -hmm. a 12 year break so we could fight a world war. Yeah. And I, I see there, you, you note in 1948 is the first time that the wheelchair athletes are allowed mm -hmm. to compete. I guess the beginnings of the Paralympics would be that, which makes sense because world war two left so mm -hmm. many young men. Yeah disabled so it would make sense that you know you're putting a a different face on on what it means to be an athlete and i i am curious um being that the 1948 olympics uh were played in 1948 when that was decided um <clears throat> because it was in london mm -hmm. um London was when, trashed in the war. Yeah. That's surprised. I, I just Googled where I it was mean, and I can't believe it was in London. I, I'm guessing that, you know, it was either it was set up prior to the war and they just held off on it. Or um, if they, they planned it shortly thereafter. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, see that that detail here but still like that's a quick turnaround that's a three-year turnaround which you know you might be looking for some sort of thing to bring people together uh following the war definitely um first televised olympics was in 1960 it was held in rome so that is it kind of another one of those groundbreaking events? Like you said, the 36 Olympics is the first time radio waves can escape the atmosphere and broadcast worldwide. Now you can actually so, see these sports being played. Yeah, but it was still, there was still a delay. Sure. Because they had to actually put them on tapes, get them to France from Rome, re-record them, get them across the Atlantic. Once they got across the Atlantic to New York City, I believe, the New York City would broadcast to, I think, Toronto and Mexico City. And from there, they would broadcast to Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So hmm. it was, I mean, I can't imagine it was less than a week or two delay in terms of broadcasting the actual event. But if you told somebody 10 years prior... Oh yeah. You can watch sports on a box and like, like that would be mind blowing to them. Yeah. Because before and, and, then they'd just be hearing it on the radio. And I do appreciate, you know, every, every Olympics has a logo kind of a thing. The logo for uh, the Rome 1960 Olympics was um, 
Romulus and Remus suckling at the teats of the wolf right over the Olympic <laughs> rings. Uh, it's wonderful. They're really leaning into it. I like it. Uh, 1968, you had the civil rights protests. Um, this is when the kind of the rise of the civil rights movement, specifically the Black Panther um, Party, and the was it the two sprinters that did the yeah, Black Power Carlos, yeah. fist raised? Carlos and Smith. And an interesting piece there is the third place sprinter, Peter Norman from Australia. Uh, he's kind of ancillary to that, but before the ceremony, he actually suggested to them, wear one, one of your gloves, just wear one. Um, and he wore a pin that basically said he was standing in solidarity with the human rights movement at the time. So people sometimes forget that, you know, he was this white guy, but he's standing there with them and he was in support of them mm -hmm. um, in that moment. And those two had their, they were sent home eventually. Mm -hmm. and kind of disgraced. I was in Mexico City, right? I believe yeah. it was. Yeah. Because they weren't supposed to do a demonstration on the podium, and you still aren't. And this year, in fact, somebody was stripped of their medal. They were docked points and were bumped down to the silver medal for celebrating on the podium. And it was really? someone who, yeah, I think he... Huh. What sport one, was it? You know, you recall one, like wrestling or judo or something. One, wow. one of the first medals his country has ever won. He got up there and kind of celebrated and they said, you can't do that. You now have silver hmm. and gave the gold to the second place guy. And I guess if I was wow. the second place guy to do the right thing would be hand the gold back to him. Like he earned it. Like, yeah. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't fail at his sport. He didn't do something wrong in his sport. And that's kind of dumb. But, um, yeah. No, I agree. I think some of that decorum stuff, and I get it because you don't want the Olympics to be about, I don't even say politics, but I guess the strife within whatever country you're hailing from. But yeah. when you have people from literally every country on earth, some of that stuff's just going to happen. And I, I, I think when you punish the athletes for expressing their opinion, whether or not you agree with it, I, I think is unfortunate. Um, or if you definitely, if you punish them for celebrating too much, um, that's definitely, I get think out of the spirit of the games. Yeah. Um, you know, the next one up is, is Munich, which 1972 Munich, Germany, and Eric, you probably know more about the details of it, but this is when some uh, terrorists, I don't remember well, from there, what country. So there's, there's two things that happened at these Olympics. One was an absolute tragedy. And the other was, was obviously a big controversy involving the U.S. Um, so the first one is the Black Se September terrorists who are Palestinian terrorists um, carried out a hostage situation and then killed 11 Israelis, nine of them athletes, two of them trainers or coaches. Um, they had help from a Western German neo-Nazi group that was still existing, existing. And keep in mind, Israel is only about 24, 25 years old as a country at this point. Um, and so this, this leads to a couple of things. One is uh, there was a uh, criminal psychologist, I believe, who Olympic organizers had tasked this guy with coming up with 26 possible scenarios for how things could go terribly wrong. Scenario 21, he described a hostage situation in which terrorist group would come into Olympic village, take members of a, of a, a country hostage and either hold them hostage or kill them and then ask for escape. And at that escape, would also entail freeing prisoners from whatever. Well, that's exactly what happened. It was called Scenario 21. Uh, the Palestinians, they demanded release of some prisoners. The German neo-Nazis demanded a release of a couple political prisoners. Uh, during a raid, um, German basically SWAT team tried to raid the Olympic Village. The Israelis were all killed along with a German police officer and um, 
the terrorists were arrested or killed. And as a result of this, you had Operation Wrath of God that the Israeli Mossad put into practice, which was uh, the the goal was not to capture, but to kill the people who carried out this attack. And uh, Israeli Mossad just... It's what they do. So I saw the movie. Eric yeah, Bana did a great did job. Fantastic. Yeah. But Mossad does not mess around with this kind of stuff. They, you, yeah. if you are on their list, you will die. Um, and of course, from another effect of this was that European countries began to uh, create counter terrorist wings to their police departments so that. This is, you know, you have like the British SAS. And if you've ever played like a Call of Duty or some of these games where um, they have the different mm-hmm. types of militarized police that deal with these kind of situations, that's what came from this. Um, so it was a, you know, it made those games pretty bad. And of course, the other thing that was a controversy was the men's basketball final, which is... Um, it's the longest three point seven seconds in the history yeah, of sport, right? Yeah, That's it, what the yeah. It it took a while. Um, so it's between the Soviet Union and the U.S. This is before you can use professional athletes. So the Americans are actually all college basketball players. The Soviets actually were professional basketball players, but being in the Soviet Union, they're listed as workers or farmers or something that's part of the collective. Um, and so it's a close game. It's like forty nine to fifty. The United States um, has the ball. The Soviets tried to call a timeout while the U.S. was shooting its free throw. The timeout was disallowed. According to the rules, they thought they were allowed that timeout between free throws. But in 1972, uh, FIBA did not allow that. So somebody had buzzed the, uh, the light to show the referees that somebody had called a timeout. They shouldn't have done that. They score the... The free throw, the U.S., they're up by one. The Soviets have the ball out of bounds with three seconds to go. They pass it in, but by the time they pass it in, the Soviet coach is yelling at the referees. And But but two seconds have burned off the clock. The referees blow the whistle. They stop the game, see what the commotion's about. And they say, okay, you want a timeout. There's one second left. And they're like, no, no, I want the timeout I had before. So this, they go at the refs, referees decide we're going to reset the clock to three seconds, which they should not have done because the timeout was called when it should not have been called. It should not have been allowed. While resetting the clock, the scores table accidentally sets it to 50 seconds. The referees hand them the ball. The referees are not checking anything. The Soviets throw the ball in and it, it gets tipped out of bounds the buzzer sounds, game over, everyone rushes to court, the Americans win by one point. Then the referees are like, well, the clock was wrong. They send everyone back. And they say, we're going to replay it. With how much time on the clock? Three seconds, again. So the game lasted 40 minutes and three seconds, which is outside the bounds of FIBA rules. A game should only last this long. So they put three seconds back on the clock. The Americans are still protesting. Um, There's some more commotion. The referees hand the ball to the Soviets. They throw it the distance of the court. The Soviet player catches the ball. The two defenders who are there are jumping to reach the ball. But when they come down, they don't have it. Their momentum carries them out of bounds. The guy is able to gather because he has three seconds, not one, has time to gather and makes a layup. Soviets win 51 to 50. And of course, the Americans protest. They go to the IOC. They say this game was not according to regulation. It was outside of regulation of time. Well, and they didn't walk out for their medal. Right. So that's going to happen, too. The Americans refused to go to the podium because they believe they were cheated. Within the next few days, they file a protest. The IOC committee, which is five members, votes anonymously three to two to uphold the, um, the results of the game. Well, this is in 1972. Three of those members of that committee were Soviet bloc nations. Two of them were NATO allied nations, right? No way. And so the American coach is like, we know what happened in that vote. We know exactly who voted. You're saying it's anonymous, but we know how this went. So 
to this day, the Americans refuse to accept those silver medals. They're in a vault in Switzerland. Now, one guy said, I'll accept them if everyone else accept them. But that's only because my wife is asking me to. When he died, he put in his will, his wife, his children, and his family in perpetuity may not accept that medal on his behalf. So they are, they will not take it. And uh, Collins. uh, Doug Collins. Doug Collins is one of those players. And again, they were all in college at the time, but it's, I mean, it's. Wow. I, I did not know that story. Eric. I mean, That's I know I can, com- I, I complain about referees a lot. I complain about <laughs> things being set up in certain ways. Um, but this was blatantly outside of the regulations and rules of basketball at the time. And the referees had no control of what was happening. They never stopped to solve the issue. They, they handed the ball in too quickly. They just, these referees, and they literally look, if you watch the video, they look like they got him off the street. They're just wearing like gray t-shirts or something. So anyways, 1972, not a great Olympics. Wow. All right. Uh, 1976, the African nations boycott. This is in regards to the apartheid, apartheid going on. Where were the Olympics being held this year? I don't remember. Montreal. Montreal. Yeah. Um, so apartheid was going on where basically, well, not basically where the African nations specifically like South Africa, where it was a caste system where they lived under a different set of rules and circumstances, not dissimilar from segregation in America. And um, as a result, they, they boycotted the Olympics. Um, 1980, Moscow. U.S. boycotts the summer games. Uh, obviously, the tensions from well, 1972 to 1980 had... Hold simmered. on a second. So right. I think this is interesting because 1980 Moscow, we boycotted. But that yeah. boycott was decided in night that was brought up in 1979. What was happening a year before these Olympics is the U.S. hockey team was preparing to go to the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid. Mm-hmm. And because we were threatening to boycott the, the Soviet Olympics, the Russians were gonna boycott the Ameri- the Olympics in Lake Placid. And so in the, in the movie Miracle, uh, he discusses this, the coach is really upset because he wants the Russians to come to the US to play hockey so that the US team can play the best team in the world. And by the U.S. threatening to boycott these Olympics, it also threatened to pull the Russians or the Soviets out of. But it, the but it wasn't Olympics. just it wasn't just the tit for tat between winter and summer. It was because the U.S. like Congress passed a resolution and Carter right. was in favor because of Russia's involvement in surprise, surprise of Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't. And so they were getting other nations in the world to like sign on to this. And right. And um, yeah, it wasn't just us. And the U S Olympic in the U S Olympic committee, even though the resolution is non-binding, they agreed to, to follow it. Yeah. Um, but it almost prevented the Soviets from coming to the winter Olympics. Mm-hmm. And then we don't get the miracle on ice, which is the next event. Uh, miracle on ice. Uh, Al Michaels becomes famous because of this. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in miracles? Yes. Yeah. Um, where the the United States, primarily college, I think, or maybe they're all a bunch of college players. Um, I guess they had to be because it was still amateur. Yeah. Beat beat the Russian uh, juggernaut in in 1980 and uh yeah it was just and the movie was with kurt russell like it's it's one of my favorite sports movies actually i'm shocked that we didn't pick it when we did our movie draft it's so good we should do a sports um, movie draft just oh, sports man. Movies. yeah uh 92 barcelona pros get to play basketball the dream team yeah, I want to get your opinion on that, Cameron. Greatest you, basketball team ever? You know, you can really make a case that 
the team after that was better. The, the 96 team was better than the 92 team because they had Shaq in 92. They had Akeem Olajuwon in 92. Um, and, and they probably, Grant Hill was on that team. They would have matched up really well with the 92 team. So um, the glaring difference was that Jordan didn't play in 96. So, um, you know, peak Jordan in 92 versus a ton of stars in 96. I don't know, man. I'd, I'd have to look at the rosters side by side. But um, I think the mystique of Larry and Magic and Jordan all on the same team in 92 was just it was cool. You know, they made a documentary, I, I think, just this past year however many years later, 28 years later, and it still gives me goosebumps because I was a young kid in 92. And I remember that so vividly. I got all the cups from um, the McDonald's drive through Yeah, each player had their own cup and they McDonald's did a really good job of, of hyping that. So, I mean, I'd probably have to give a nod to the 92 team, but you could, you could make a really good argument about well, one argument about 96. Well, and if you go back from the, the 1912 Jim Thorpe, you know, when he got mm-hmm. his medal strip for being a pro athlete to the 92 games, when they basically removed that stipulation and now yeah. the pros can, and they did like these, especially the 92 team, like those guys are all a bunch of first ballot hall of famers on that team. Like they're mm-hmm. all, you could throw all obviously Jordan, greats. but you could throw them all in the goat conversation. Obviously, right. Jordan being at the top of the list, and same thing with the '96 team. And but now, with this most current basketball team, it's like now. And I'm not begrudging them, but pro athletes, especially the superstars, are like, is it worth it for me to play in the Olympics? And what if I get hurt? And it's a contract year. And and I'm not saying yeah. they should or shouldn't. But those 90s teams were just unbelievable. Well, it was it was a novelty then, right? Yeah. You know, now it's I'm going to play one year. I'm going to get my gold medal and add it to my all time resume. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to ride off into the sunset. Sure. And now that LeBron's gotten his gold medal and all of that. Who's you the know, oldest guy on the team? Is it Kevin Durant? Probably Durant, who's 29, and, and 30. So you got a like bunch that. of young guys that aren't maybe are not superstars yet. Right. Right. Um, and it's a different style of play, too. The international game is is not isolation. And well, also it, look it, at the international teams. So the, they're filled with NBA players. Right. So right. it is four or five on every roster. It's, it's gotten a lot better. As far as the competition, it's gotten a lot better. Yeah. Um, that's good for the game. You want that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Kevin Durant is a superstar, obviously, but. Sure. Yeah. It's, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I could go on and on about this, but um, yeah, the way that they set up that, whoever put together that team and made the selections this year is just way off because it's a different style of play and, and what works in the NBA um, does not work in, in the Olympic game. Yeah. Well, and they said like, they were pleasantly surprised that, uh, Booker, Drew Holiday and Middleton honored their Olympic commitments because they literally had to hop on a plane the next yeah. day to go. Yeah. To yeah. So it's exhausting. Um, what about uh 96? I remember this cause my uncle Jack, uh, he actually lived in Atlanta during these Olympics and um, I remember there's a bit of a controversy because it was the hundred years and Athens got beat out to be the host city for the Olympic for the hundred year anniversary of the Olympics. Um, they eventually did the 2000 games in Sydney, but or not that they didn't. Um, 2004, 2004 was in Athens. Yeah, in Athens yeah. yeah. Sydney was not Greece. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and then also there was the bombing in, in, was it in the village or, or near the village? But there was the Atlantic, the bombing it was in area. One in of Atlanta. the open areas. Yeah. It was just outside. Um, yeah. So kind of. I, I remember um, Muhammad Ali. He was heavily, I, I think he light, lit the flame that year. And that was the big thing that I remember 
uh, that year because he was he was deep into his uh, Parkinson's and you know a, not not the same Muhammad Ali that we remember. But I remember just mm-hmm. how revered he was by all the athletes, and and I was you know that was a big moment. I was a young kid still. I was thirteen at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, it was, uh, that was Michael Johnson was the, uh, superstar mm-hmm. track athlete in those games, yeah. 92 and 96. Mm-hmm. Um, 2008, man, Beijing and say what you will about China. And there's a lot you can say they put on a heck of Olympic games in 2008. And I, I just remember, cause Eric, this is when I first moved down to Arizona with you and we were watching it and Bob Costas basically said China invented everything in the history of the world during that Olympic games. And he's not really wrong because they did invent (laughs) a ton of stuff, but it was just funny. Like, but they had an incredible opening and closing ceremonies. But I think the the biggest highlight would have to be Michael Phelps that year. Oh yeah. That was the year he broke Spitz's record, right, Cameron? Yeah. Everybody becomes a swimming fan every four years. And it's, it's just great to, to see that because I have an affinity for swimming and I swam sure. for years. So when I, when everybody knows what butterfly is every four years, it, it's, it's cool. But yeah, Phelps was, you don't ever get that amount of recognition as a swimmer. And it was just, it was cool. And, you know, that was all the talk of, um, you know, the, the, what was it? 12,000 calories a day. And Mm -hmm. they, they took you through what he ate. So it just lent itself to TV and, you know, he was in and out of the water with the prelims and the semis and the finals. And, you know, they, they'd go over his, his, um, schedule and it was just insane. There was so much pressure on him and he did exactly what he was supposed to do in record breaking fashion. So that was to me, the, the most memorable Olympics. I, I stayed up all night and watched all the Olympic sports that you've never heard of in 2008. Cause that was, uh, that was, well, you know, pre kids. I remember correctly, one of those races, I think it was a relay and he was mm-hmm. the anchor and he brought them like they were not winning when he jumped in and yeah. he brought him back and he won it by a fingernail. Like uh-huh. it was unbelievable. And I'm not a, like, I'm not a swimming guy. As mm-hmm. you well know, Cameron, I'm not a swimming <laughs> guy, um, but it was hard not to get excited watching him swim oh, and to see if he could do it. I mean, yeah, it was hard not to get swept into that. Yeah, nobody um, could breathe after after that touch. Nobody could breathe. Oh my gosh, what happened? And they had to go to photo finish. It was so cool. And I think in that same Olympics is when Usain Bolt made his appearance to the world. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so what Michael Phelps was doing in the water, Usain Bolt was doing on the track, and I mean, he's got to be the greatest sprinter of all time, at least in, in modern memory. Yeah. yeah. And they, they don't, they don't call it the best 10 seconds in sports for no reason. I mean, that is yeah. so much pressure and so exciting and, mm-hmm. oh man, they're all the flash bulbs going off and, and yeah. Usain Bolt dominated more than I think I've ever seen at the Olympics, man. It looked like he was jogging and he would just smash world uh, records. Well, and there's that photo of him smiling for the camera as he's blowing by them right. towards the finish right. line. I mean, that just tells you how dominant he was. Um, yeah. Oh, one more Olympics. I got to bring up 2012. So she, Bob Costas's double pink eye. You guys remember that? I do. <laughs> he got the double pink eye and he tried to soldier on, man. But... He looked awful. <laughs> yeah. It's a goat right there. That's the goat. Bob Costas. Bob Costas. Yeah. Yeah. He's been doing he's it great, since I was man. a kid. Yeah. Um, so real quick before we kind of sign off, I, I just wanted to bring up the Simone Biles. Um, obviously, as, as we're all well aware now, and it's been even more, um, she withdrew out of the team all around for gymnastics and uh, then withdrew out of the individual all around. And now she's withdrawn out of, I think, the other like vault and other events she had scheduled for the rest of this Olympics. She has one event left, I believe, that she's still Deciding. available for as of Sunday night. So <laughs> the the summary of it was during the finals of the all around, I think she did a vault and um, she didn't do very good. And 
she withdrew. And at the time they said she withdrew for a mental issue. Um, and then we later come on to find out she had a case of what's called the twisties, um, which basically means you're up there spinning in the air. You can't tell where the ground is. And so when you land, you don't know where the ground is. And a lot of times you'll end up just crashing onto the floor um, because you can't gauge your distance. And I guess it's something that a lot of gymnasts have, and then they have to kind of relearn how to do those spins. Um, So that's what she withdrew from. When she withdrew though, the United States was trying to vie for a gold medal um, against the athletes from Russia, which is a whole other discussion. And, uh, she withdrew and, and ended up going to, um, I don't know who, who replaced her, but they ended up getting silver. And then uh, Sunisa Lee from Minnesota took her place in the individual all around and, and ended up winning gold. And I don't know how the other events have gone since then, but it created quite a firestorm of discussion all, all over the internet and media. So I just kind of want to get your uh, opinions on that. You you go, Eric. I'm gonna I'm gonna withhold mine for a second. Okay. I think uh, early on I was fairly critical in my own mind, but I was also trying to wrap my head around what was actually happening because was it an injury? It was mental health. She described the twisties, and you're kind of like, all right, well, is that like the yips? Yes, it's like the yips. But if I have the yips, the worst thing that happens is I strike out. I don't become a quadriplegic. Um because that's very possible. If you are up in the air spinning like that 15 feet above the ground and you land wrong, that could be it for you. Like normal life is over. Um, and bringing in mental health. Um, I think the past six months have made me a little bit more sensitive to that. Um, just one too many people that have due to some, mental health issue are no longer here. So I don't think that's what she's in danger of because there's various scales and severity of mental health uh, illnesses. And um, so I also want to kind of equate it to uh, Naomi Osaka. I, I, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But, and if your anxiety is talking to the press and well, that's kind of, that's how these events get funded is through the press and through the, um, you know, publication and the promotion of these things. So Naomi Osaka opting out of the, you know, leaving Wimbledon. Yeah. You're, you're not going to get paid and you shouldn't get paid um, because talking to the press is part of the job because that's how they pay for that event. The same thing with Marshawn Lynch. He's not, he's just there. So it doesn't get fined. He doesn't like talking to the press, but that's how the NFL is structured because they need to sell their product and they sell it through the press. Simone Biles doesn't have a problem with the press, but she obviously doesn't feel comfortable. Um, That's fair. Maybe I don't think she should have the silver medal that her team earned without her, but I I, I don't know how much she contributed to that either. So um, I think if it's drawn some attention to mental health, good, because we are not taking that seriously. And, you know, she's 25, 24, um, and all of the pressure for these Olympics were put on her. All of it. I mean, I I don't even think USA basketball had this much pressure to go out and dominate everything. So um, as far as the consequences, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll listen to athletes a little bit more and have a little bit more grace. Um, I know that the, the comparisons to her and other people who haven't quit are there, but I mean, Carrie Strug was in immense pain when she landed her, her vault with a busted up ankle. Um, there's a, another Russian gymnast in the nineties who, just kept getting pushed and she did fall and she spent the rest of her life in a wheelchair and died at 43. 
that's not worth it. So, but these are the Olympics. Um, uh, you, you want to push yourself and if you know you're getting to your limit, then yeah, I'm glad she knows her limit because I, I'd hate for her to get hurt. I hate for anyone to get severely hurt in, in Olympics. Sure. Um, I, th- I think at the last winter Olympics, uh, a, uh, a uh, loser or a skeleton uh, guy flew off the track and died oh, yeah. during trials. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you are pushing the limit uh, goat status in jeopardy. I don't know. I, I mean, I put that Pretty up great. there cause Jeff asked, um, I talked to him earlier this week and he was, it was something we generally discussed, uh, but Cameron, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I, and I, and I like your take on it, Eric. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Obviously, when you look at it on, you know, the talking heads and social media and on the internet and everything, there's all there's one side or the other. There's oh, she either either quit on her team and you never ever do that, and oh my gosh, that's that's deplorable, or oh my gosh, she's a hero and you know she needs to be praised for taking her mental health into account, and everybody needs to um, take a page out of her book and athletes aren't robots and you know all all of those things um i i think it's okay to agree with both sides of the the story there yes she, it's it's a bummer that she gave up on her team that she wasn't didn't feel like she was able to um contribute um but you know i think she did the right thing and i don't think that she owes us the the fan a uh an explanation i think she owes a her teammates an explanation Mm -hmm. but sticking a microphone in her face and and trying to get her to um explain herself is i I mean that's a very personal thing we don't know what she's going through we don't know what the spins or the the twisties are I mean, I had literally never heard of that. And, you know, if she thinks she's in, in danger and if she's worried about hurting herself, I think she's earned the right to say, no, I am going to hurt myself or others by doing this. So, yeah, I mean, good for her for um, standing up and, and doing the right thing that, that she felt like. And, and I'm sure it was a gut wrenching decision, um, but also don't glorify her for you know, something that just, that's what you do as a human being is, is you make a decision that, Hey, I'm in danger here. You know, go ahead and, and, and follow through with that. Um, I, I hate, I, I like when people, I, I love and respect people that quit on their own terms that say, Nope, this is not good for me. I need mm-hmm. to get out. Um, as far as the goat status in jeopardy, no, absolutely not. She's, she's earned the right, um, to make that decision. She's got way more Olympic medals than, than anybody else. She's got moves and, and tricks that, um, no other woman has ever pulled off ever. Yeah, um, and there's only a handful of men that can even pull that off. You know, um, to me, she's the hands down best gymnast and this doesn't tarnish that it's an ugly thing but you know how many other a- athletes went through things that maybe they wish they would have had back or didn't yeah. go well i mean even jordan had his gambling scandal and, and that kind of thing and kobe had his sexual assault scandal so she's going to look back on this and, and regret it but she did the right thing absolutely and not I, to not to bring this back to me but you know <laughs> of course when, when i was <laughs> Uh, you know, on, on, on Tuesday or on Monday, you know, I, I attempted something, a kettlebell exercise without the kettlebell. And, you know, when I knew my limit, I quit. I I knew that was my limit. And wow. I, I mean, I not to bring it to, back to you, but you did. I Eric and Simone Biles have a lot. I'm in glad is what I'm getting out of this. I bet Simone I, Biles is going to watch it. She, she goes, I'm being, I feel seen now yeah. because Eric gets it. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Cause I, my <laughs> legs were not going to do it. And if I kept going, I was just going to hurt myself. You're so. in danger. I mean, I can't, Cameron respects that about you. Eric, <laughs> that you knew your limit. I would like to give oh. my opinion. 
Real quick, uh, I agree. I generally agree with you guys. I I think I don't think her goat status is in jeopardy. She does things that no other Olympian can do. She's literally reinventing the sport before our eyes. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I do think when I first heard about this and and after I figured out what the twisties were, um, but I, I looked at like the consequences. What are the consequences of her withdrawing? And at the time, well, the US took silver, but based on the what I understand is they weren't gonna win the gold anyway because she did a poor vault. Um, and that had knocked them below. So even if she had stayed in, it was almost impossible for them to catch up and, and take gold. Um, and on the individual all around, it allowed Sunisa Lee to win the gold in place of her. So now a new star has had some mm -hmm. success. And it seems like Simone Biles could not be happier for her, um, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So, I, I mean, I think... <clears throat> You know, and in general, the consequences of her withdrawing are the U.S. doesn't win as many medals, which is unfortunate, but it's, you know, I, I don't know if Simone Biles is doing this for me as an American. You know, I, I think she does it for herself and she probably does it for her teammates and then she does it for America third. And I I, I know a lot of viewers and, and people that watch think, well, they're doing it for America, but Whenever I played, and granted, not at any level close to this, but whenever I played sports, I wasn't doing no, it. No, it's okay. I compared myself to an Olympic athlete. You sure. the same. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. But when I when I did play sports, when I ran track specifically, I, I mean, I did it for myself. I wanted to see if I could do it good and if I could compete for my own benefit. And then I also did it for my teammates. And then on a third level, I did it for the school that my team was a part of. But I, I guess... I, kind of alluding to what you said, Cameron, she doesn't owe us an explanation because it's her decision and it's been her yeah. journey. And, um, you know, I, I, the more I've chewed on this, I, the more I, I understand where she's coming from. And I think it was, like you said, the right choice. Um, cause you got to take care of yourself, especially as a gymnast, um, because they don't have those NBA contracts, right? Like, yeah. I mean, if you don't, you know, if your if your body, if your mind is telling you that your body can't do it, then you need to listen to your mind. Because if you ruin your body, that's it. She doesn't have a fallback like a lot at of 24 years old. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we talked about the consequences and Jake, you mentioned the consequences of that and, you know, gold or silver instead of gold. I, I feel like she's living with the consequences pretty well. She made a mm -hmm. decision and she's handling it and she's been a great teammate and you know she's probably over explained it to be honest with you but she's got yeah. a lot of crap and she's dealt with it so and she's well, out there screaming thing. for him yeah she's, she's out there she's right. real hard she's yeah. right. hard for him and uh there's some a uh, gymnasts that we now have a better handle on that if it had all been about her which it would have been if she had kept going mm -hmm. uh these other girls don't get their time in the line sure. and, uh, and tonight, maybe they don't win so silver at least maybe it would have been don't yeah. medal would have been last night um in the vault two americans um both from arizona by the way competed and won one silver so you know other people get to rise to the top and it's not at her expense she actually gets to be a part of it yeah. um and that's that's a that's a team thing that's a, that's a really Absolutely. good teammate actually Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that's a good place to stop. I mean, I, I think it was a great discussion overall, um, kind of learning about the history of the Olympics and then letting that flow into the modern Olympics and, and into a very current issue that we've, our, everyone is discussing today. Um, I don't think I have anything else to add, Eric or Cameron, if you want to sign us off. Yeah. yeah. Um, shout out to Simone Biles. Don't forget to like, comment, <laughs> subscribe. Simone, we're big fans. Um, I, I can I can regale you with stories of my past too. If you need any advice, just just hit us up. You know, yeah, I'll post comment. a TikTok of me with a kettlebell here soon. If you want, <laughs> just to inspire. I'm sure you. she'll appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next week, don't forget to join us for. Um, our review of George Orwell's 1984, one of my favorite one. books. So, so timely yeah. right now. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Signing off for Dad Bod History.
All right. See ya. That was perfect, Cameron. That was the best sign-off we've had in a long time. (laughs) 